Okay, so we're back. Thank you very much for stopping by today. I really appreciate all the support. As you can see, we've had an awful lot of views and folks who are subscribing. Today, I'd like to take a minute to go ahead and approach something that's a little bit more exotic, if you will. If you've been in the real estate business longer than, say, 10, 15 years, you know a lot about this already. But if you've been in the business less than 10 years, you probably have not really heard of this sort of thing at all. And the reason why is because it's not really been used very much. But I'm going to go back to a technique that was used commonly uh, in the 1980s, uh, early in the 1990s. And then after 19, about 96, 7, it wasn't really needed anymore. But because of today's new financing uh, arrangements, because the qualifications are so much higher, you need to actually prove that you have money. <laughs> you actually prove that you have a down payment, where the money comes from. Imagine that. A bank wants to know uh, where you're actually getting your money. We need to go ahead and find some creative ways to go ahead and get our listings sold that appear to be unsaleable. And we need to get the buyers that we have financing who appear to be unfinanceable. Okay, and part of that way is from through some exotic financing. It's not really exotic at all. It just needs a little bit more explanation. Okay, so to start off, let's examine a couple things. The first thing is when you're starting to talk about, you know, selling the unsellable. Okay, selling the unsellable. We have to understand what makes this property unsellable. Okay. And if you know anything about real estate, the reason why a home doesn't sell is always the price. It doesn't matter what location it is. It doesn't matter if it's in a ghetto. It doesn't matter if it's in the top of the foothills. It doesn't matter if it's in great shape or a trailer in terrible condition. There is absolutely nothing that price cannot fix. If you say to me, Carl, hey, look, I've had this listing. I know it's priced well. I know that it's, you know, it's in the right neighborhood, but yet there's no buyers out there. Then let me ask you a question. If it's priced so well, in fact, if it's priced below market, how come is it then that maybe you haven't bought it? So ask yourself, would I buy this property? Now, selling the unsaleable really revolves around a couple things, okay? You've got Mr. Homeowner, all right, who wants a certain amount of money. That's pretty common. Most of the time they are either upside down or, or maybe they want a little bit more than it's worth, okay? But then you have the house down the street, okay, and he's asking a little bit less, okay? Now there's a couple of things that we need to assume here. The first thing we need to assume is that these sellers are able to sell, that they are not underwater, okay? Not underwater. If they're underwater, then some of these techniques are not going to work very well. Now, there are ways to do it, but the problem is that it gets to be a little bit more dangerous, and I'm not really going to go into it at this point. But assuming that these particular properties do have equity, okay, then you can go ahead and sell these properties even if maybe they're a little bit higher in the price. And let me show you how, okay? Now, the first thing you need to understand is if you ask any realtor, okay? Ask any realtor, okay, what determines a sales price? Many times that realtor will come to you and say, well, what determines the sales price is the comps. And if you really think about it, that's not true at all. What really determines the sales price is what a willing buyer is willing to pay an accepting seller. Okay? The limitations that we put upon the sales price are a function of the comps and the appraisal. Right? So if we say, okay, well, look, this home, okay, is worth... $100,000, we base that as realtors a lot of times upon the comps and the appraisal, which is a function of what the most buyers would pay, okay? But if most buyers are going to pay only $100,000 for this home, does that mean that most buyers equal this buyer? And the answer is no. Most buyers 
do not equal one buyer. Now, I'm not talking about that, that, that homeowner that says, well, all we need is one buyer. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is if you have a particular circumstance or situation or a property that is unique, okay, then you're going to be able to go ahead and compete on a level that other homes cannot. All right. So for example, let me explain another way to do this. Okay. These basic understandings, I think are going to be critical for you to understand the rest of everything else I'm about to tell you. So in this particular circumstance, you have to compete, okay, on a couple different levels. To get your home sold, you have to be able to compete in terms of price or terms or condition, location, okay? Those are all factors when determining how you're going to compete. If your home is the lowest priced in a subdivision and all things being equal, then your home will sell first. If your home is higher priced than all the others, then it naturally will not sell unless certain other factors come into play, i.e. the terms or the condition or maybe even location. So for example, most realtors will go off and start by saying, well, look, we're going to go by price per square foot and that's going to help us determine a sales price. The problem with going by price per square foot, it, it does not take into account the condition of the property. So for example, you have a foreclosure that has all the cabinets ripped out, the sinks are gone, the you know, place is torn to bits, and it sells for about, say, $50 a square foot. Okay, That's a good rule of thumb, but it's not the whole equation. So for example, if it sells for $50 a square foot, does that mean the exact same model down the street with the same square footage, but yet in better condition, has the cabinets, has the sinks, has the house in good order? Does that mean it should also sell for $50 a square foot? And the answer clearly is no. So we can see that right from the bat, that price, okay, as determined by price per square foot, okay, is not necessarily the best way to determine a sales price. Condition plays a factor. Okay? If you have two properties of the same square footage, 1,900 square feet, then one is on the corner of a busy street, okay? And the other is in the middle of a subdivision on a cul-de-sac then the one that's on the corner of the busy street or bordering the busy street is going to sell for approximately 10% less than the other one. So we can see that location also has a factor here. So what can the effect of terms mean? Now terms, when we're talking about terms, what we're talking about is the ability of the seller, okay, to go ahead and make the financing in such a way that it's easier for the buyer to qualify or easier for the buyer to get this home. So let's talk about seller financing. In seller financing, what we're talking about is creating terms or situations or environments where a buyer can buy this property, okay, in otherwise unsaleable conditions. For example, all right, if you have a buyer who does not qualify, for example, for a regular loan, a conventional loan, FHA, VA, or something along those lines, does that therefore mean that they are unable to buy a home? In most realtors' eyes, this means, yes, they cannot buy a home, and that's where they end. Though their credit is bad, or the, you know, their, their situation is such that they've only been on the job for a year, or two years, a year and a half, something like that, where they don't qualify. But I would venture to say to you that I would not necessarily throw that buyer out just yet. Remember a little while ago when we had the two homes, okay, with all things being equal, all right, one guy wants this, and the other guy wants that. How do you sell this home that's higher priced versus the one that is not? If you have a buyer, okay, who does not qualify for traditional financing, this might be the market value 
that might be what is indicated by the comps. That might be what's indicated by the appraisal, which is simply a function of history. Okay, what most people have bought under similar circumstances. But if you have a buyer, such as an independent contractor, realtor, something like that, if you are like me, let's say, and you have your stuff in a corporation where all the money is being paid to a corporation, and then I get paid a certain amount from the corporation, you can see I write off everything. If you look at my tax records, you'll see that you know I write off everything, including the camera that you are now seeing this from. I'm writing that off. And that means my income, okay, is very, very low. So I may not qualify for this home. Does that therefore mean that I cannot afford a home? Not at all. And the reason why is because I may have as a buyer, I may have as a realtor, a lot of money to put down, but I don't necessarily have good credit or I don't necessarily have, uh, you know, uh, a great uh, tax return or uh, income because I'm writing everything off and you can't do stated income loans anymore like you used to. What if you had a seller who had equity like we talked about before and you said, okay, well, look, Mr. Seller, I will tell you what, because I don't qualify for the regular stuff, but I do qualify for non-traditional financing. I will pay you a little bit more for this home for the ability to use seller financing. If this guy says that he will accept seller financing and this guy says, no, I will not accept seller financing, then that creates a situation where he is more competitive than this guy. Now, will for most people, this mean that he's more attractive? Yes. If you have a qualified buyer, somebody who's got credit, somebody who's got a down payment, somebody who can make it happen like that, then they may not need this seller financing. But if you have somebody who maybe has a little bit lower credit score, may not qualify, but they do have some money or the ability to get some, then they could, because they can't qualify here, they could qualify here, this becomes more important. And the seller can charge a premium for this. Now pay attention real close. The seller can charge a premium, ask more money, because they offer out terms that the competition will not. If they are will, unwilling or unable to compete, okay, on terms, I'm sorry, on price, they can't be number one in terms of price. They can't go down anymore. Their condition is fine. Their location is okay then the only place they can be number one, if you will, might be the terms, which is seller financing. So the question then becomes, how do they get this seller financing? Okay, I'm glad you asked. To sell the unsaleable, you have to think outside the box, especially in this marketplace, okay? If you have a home, okay, that has an underlying loan, let's say, because my math, I'm not that smart, let's say the math, is $100,000. That's their underlying loan. And I tell the seller, you know what? I like this house. Okay, I want to buy this house. I don't qualify for regular financing, but I know that you are willing to take owner financing. And you're telling me that you're willing to take 20% down and finance the other $80,000. Now, most of the time, we think about this equation, all right, as it pertains to paid off homes, okay, or 100% equity. But I would tell you that what if they had an underlying loan of $100,000? A $100,000 loan, I put $20,000 into this, I owe the seller $80,000, which he's going to finance, but he owes $100,000. How do I buy this property? Okay, here's how. How you do that, and this is where history comes in. You purchase it by AITD, okay? A, which is, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, hold on. <laughs> have a brain fart here for a minute. Uh, trust deed. 
all inclusive, my brain finally kicked in, inclusive, all inclusive trust deed, AITD, okay? You may know this otherwise known as a wrap. A wraparound, a wraparound mortgage, a wrap, something along those lines. That's what it's called. But really what we're talking about is what's called an all-inclusive trust deed. Okay? Now, how the all-inclusive trust deed works, all right, is very simple. You take the seller's original loan, okay, which is $100,000, okay? You give them some equity, $20,000, to get the right to do this. They give you a wraparound loan for the, say the other, uh, let's say they owe, um, let's say they owe 60,000 and you've given them 20, which means they've got to give you another loan for $40,000, right? I think that's right. So 40, you've given them 20, let's see, they owe 100, you've given them 20, so we got 80, Let's see, 20, 80, 80, okay. They owe 100,000, you've given them 20, they owe 80. Now the full sales price, what they're going to sell the property to you for, is going to be, let's say, 120, okay? Now, if your total sales price is 120,000, total sales price equals 120,000, okay? Down payment from you to them equals 20,000. Their underlying loan to the bank is 80,000, okay? Then there is a balance of $20,000. Right? We all together? So if that's the case, all right, what you're essentially paying for here is the loan that they owe and the additional amount. Okay? So how does this work? Now, how this works is you go down and you write this note, I'm sorry, you write this contract as an all-inclusive trustee to wrap where you tell the seller, okay, look, I'm gonna give you the $20,000 down, but on your loan for $80,000, which is left, the balance, okay, I will go ahead and assume that payment or take care of that payment for you, and I will also go ahead and take care of, you know, just some equity for you. Uh, I'll pay you an additional amount for this premium so I can do this of $20,000. Their original mortgage is, let's say, at 5%. And you say, okay, and for the right to go ahead and do financing this way, I will go ahead and pay you 6% on your loan. So how that works, then, is their loan is covered, right? They've got $20,000 in their pocket, okay? Now you're taking over the payments. You take this to the title company. Fidelity, uh, Fidelity National Title, Kathy Wright, uh, does this all the time. And what will happen is when you make your payments, okay, your payment goes to the title company. The title company, therefore, then pays the mortgage. And they also pay the seller. The remainder, okay? This protects you because the mortgage is paid. You know that the bank will not foreclose on this. Under no circumstances should you ever send the money straight to the seller because there's nothing preventing the seller from defaulting on the mortgage, which gives you no protection, okay? To the seller, it's great protection because they know that the title company is paying the mortgage, that there is no problem, that the mortgage is being covered, and they get a return on their money, 6% which you can present to the seller by saying, look, if you take all the cash out of this property, if I sell it and I get, uh, say if I give it to you $100,000, which is the market value of this property, you're only gonna make $20,000. You're gonna take that $20,000, you're gonna put it in a CD or something, you're gonna make 1% on your interest, okay? Or you could sell it in this fashion at 120,000, give someone the right to go ahead and do seller financing, a wrap, an all-inclusive trust deed, 
and you will make 6% on your money. And at the end, you can, if you wanted to, you could amortize this, okay, over 30 years, amortization over 30 years. And if the seller feels like it needs to be a little bit, uh, they don't want to hold the note for 60 year, or 30 years, then you can go and have a balloon payment in five years. Where the buyer needs to go ahead and come up and refinance the loan for, you know, in the end of five years and pay the seller completely off. For the next five years, they're gaining 6% on their money. Their principal's not really been touched that much. And then they get their principal back, meaning that they've really essentially not lost a lot of money in terms of the market going down because they've, been, they've already established a sales price of $120,000. they are not going to lose value there. And worse comes to worse, if this person does not perform, they keep the 20% and they foreclose and they take the home over and they do it again if that's what they want to do. This is a great way for people to go ahead and make a lot of money over time, especially if they don't need it right now. This gives you the ability to sell the home at a little bit higher price. And you say, well, wait a minute. How is it that they're going to pay higher than the average sales price? Who in the world would do that? Who would do this? The person who would do this, again, would be the person like myself, okay? I'm sorry, the buyer who cannot qualify for regular sales financing. Okay, they may have a lot of cash, but they can't do it. They've just got foreclosed on, say, two years ago, and their job situation straightened out, and now they've got cash. Okay, their job's back together, their situation's all together. Now they can finance, or now they can go ahead and qualify, or, or I'm sorry, they can't qualify, but they have cash. They can do this, okay? The other reason why is there are no appraisals. That's a great thing. You can sell this property not only for 100,000, you can sell it for 120, 130, 140. It doesn't matter. Whatever the buyer is willing to pay and the seller is willing to accept will tell you then the market value, not the comps, not the appraisal. That is the true market value of this property because there are no appraisals. There are no loan costs. Okay? No loan costs because the only cost involved is what's closing at the title company and the down payment. The other reason why this is really good is the, uh, is the paperwork involved. If you have ever tried to qualify for a loan in the last five years, then you know that how hard it is to qualify. You've got to show them everything five ways from Sunday. And a lot of people, they just don't want to do that. Okay, why do they not want to do that? Well, it could be a various reasons. It could be they have, you know, some uh, some spotty uh, is history in the background where you know they may have lost their job for a period of time, which you know stops them from qualifying. You know, going through the hassle of providing paperwork, filling out application to uh, 1003. It could be a various reasons. Okay, it is very cheap to close. Okay, very cheap to close because all you're involved with here is the closing costs. Okay. It is also cheap because you have servicing with the title company, which is also very cheap, okay? So, some of you, if you've been around and you're watching this, you say, well, wait a minute, Carl. Doesn't this property have a due on sale clause? Yes, it does. Most liens these days have a due on sale clause. And if you're not familiar with it, a due on sale clause is simply this, where if the interest of the home is transferred in any way, the bank, therefore, who has the underlying lien, has the right to go ahead and call the whole, new, whole note due and payable, accelerate the payment, and say, okay, now is the time for you to pay. You sold this home to Carl, now it's time for you to pay us everything you owe. Okay? It does have that. They have that right. But it doesn't mean that they will necessarily exercise the right. I want you to think about this. If you are a bank and you have an asset, okay, that is performing, the bank's getting their money on regular time, the bank is not losing any money, they're in fact getting their payments every month, there's no problem, the taxes are being paid through the PITI, through the title company, you know, they're getting their money, they're performing, okay, they have an option. 
they can go ahead and call this no due. But think about it. With all the non-performing assets, most banks are going to look at this and say, well, why upset the Apple cart? Okay, there's no purpose in that for us. There's no money in it for us. If we keep this asset that's performing, okay, then we're able to go ahead and collect interest on this. We're not losing money. If we call the note due now, okay, then we have a non-performing asset. We don't have any asset at all. We're not collecting insurance. We're not, I'm sorry, interest. We're not collecting anything. So for the most part, as long as your taxes are paid and the mortgage is paid, then the mortgage company that has the asset will more often than not, not call that and do on sale clause. Okay. More often than not. It doesn't mean they won't, but I want you to think about it this way. You have possible and then you have probable. It is possible that they could call that note, but it is improbable that they will not. Okay. It's improbable that they will. Again, possible that they could, not probable that they will. And the reason why is because it is simply performing. So how do you go ahead and manage this? Because if you transfer the title, okay, the bank's going to find out about this and they're going to throw a fit. Well, okay. How you protect the seller and how you protect yourself or your buyer, okay, is to go ahead and make sure of a couple things. Make sure... Now, this is not hiding anything. This is not being underhanded. This is not being uh, uh, unethical. What you're going to say is the insurance, okay, is the insurance policy is originally in the owner's name, okay? So if it's in the owner's name, keep it there because the owner needs to have the house protected as well. If you burn the house down, then they want to know that their insurance is going to cover that. But you also want to go ahead and name yourself as additional insured. So you're protected as well. So think about it this way. They're protected from the insurance. You're protected from the insurance. And the asset management, the, the, the bank that owns the underlying lien, is not harmed in any way. They are not going to call for that because they, A, are not going to probably know, and B, they're still covered. Again, you don't do any of this by hiding it or being, you know, underhanded. It's all done on the up and up at the title company, done every day, okay? And everybody is protected. You're not cutting anybody out of the loop. You're disclosing everything. And the fact is that it's very safe for everybody, okay? And then, of course, the second thing you want to ensure that you do is make sure that the taxes are paid, okay? As long as the taxes are paid, then they're good to go. The owner's covered, you're covered, and so is the bank. You make sure that the taxes are paid through the title company and the PITI, okay? Now, here's the thing that is good for your buyer. If you're representing the buyer, okay, in this situation, what's good for them is that the buyer, okay, cannot lose. They can't lose. They just can't, okay? If they go out and they purchase this home for, let's say, $100,000 and they put down 3% or 5% or 20% or 10% or whatever they put down as a down payment, okay, then if that home goes down in value, then they are solely bearing the equity loss in this home. That's their responsibility. That's what they are losing, okay? If, on the other hand, they go ahead and they put down 20% on a home, okay, through seller financing, the seller is the one who maintains the equity. The seller is the one who maintains the equity. So any value that goes down, okay, the buyer is only into it for how much they put into it in the initial deposit, okay, the initial down payment. That's as most as they're put into, so their, their limit, their exposure is limited, okay? Worst comes to worst, they lose their job, things go to hell in a handbasket, okay? Then they've lost their 20% down. If, they had, if the seller had to foreclose on them because they lost their job or whatever, then the seller forecloses, they lose the $20,000 down, 
and they've lost some principle, that's true. But the thing is, the amount of principle that they've lost is so inconsequential, it doesn't even make sense. Whereas if it's financed through a bank, then they've lost not only the principal, not only the other stuff, but then they've also lost their credit rating, okay? Whereas with seller financing, okay, it's not equated to their credit rating. Hello, yeah, it's not equated to their rating because more often than not, the seller is not going to go ahead and report them to a credit agency saying, hey, this guy defaulted on a loan from me. It's not gonna happen. So for the buyer's perspective, they can't lose the equity or anything else that they put into it, just their initial down payment. They have no equity to lose except for this minimal amount of principal that they've paid. And the seller is not going to hit them for the, uh, hit them for the, uh, the credit, okay? They could go out two weeks later after they get a job, have a gift from their dad or whatever it is and do it all over again. There's absolutely no problem with that. And in fact, one of the advantages for the buyer is they can do this over and over. If you've got an investing client, they are limited by how much money they can go ahead and borrow from a bank by how many properties they can own. Some of the banks and some of the situations will say you can only own 20 homes, 10 homes, 30 homes, whatever it is. But there's absolutely no reason why a person with seller financing, whether it be with an all-inclusive trust deed or just a straight owner carryback, cannot own 300 homes. There's nothing saying that. If every single one of these is owned on an owner carryback or seller financing, all-inclusive trust deed, land contract, however you want to put it, there's nothing saying they can't do it over and over and over again. Okay? Now for a seller, the advantage to the seller, they have a lot of advantage, okay? The seller, they have interest. If they don't need their money, okay, then they're gonna make interest on this house a lot more, on their equity, a lot more than they ever would have in, the, in, in any other investment. Think about it, can you go to the stock market today and put in say twenty thousand dollars and make a, a guaranteed six seven percent interest rate on that or six or seven percent return no you can't okay yes i know it hit thirteen thousand the other day which is great but it's not consistent they can't take their twenty thousand dollars and put it into a cd and expect to make more than one percent it's just not feasible they can't take that $20,000 and put it into a bond or treasury note or anything like that and expect to get anywhere near 6 or 7%. just can't happen. And what's more is it can't be collateralized, which the seller is able to collateralize this loan with the house. So their loan is protected. If this person defaults and the note is written correctly, the seller can quickly establish uh, that they own the property and throw, throw these people out, take the house over, and look, if they keep that 20% down, put it into a CD or whatever, and they don't touch it, okay, let's pretend it's a $100,000 house you're doing this to, all right, the seller has got $20,000, they take that money, they don't touch it, they put it into a CD, which they're making 1% on, the buyer is paying them 6 or 7% on this interest, so they're making maybe 7 or 8% on their total income on this entire affair. And if the seller has to foreclose, their concern is, well, what if the guy tears the house apart? Well, okay, let's pretend that he does. You're able to throw them out so quickly. Generally speaking, you can put this home back together for less than 20000 and you've been keeping the interest, okay? Now, I will tell you, that this has been done over and over and over again. And that's how banks make a lot of money. And that's how a lot of sellers make money in this marketplace as well. The other advantage to the seller is it's deferred capital gains. Now you wanna tell them to go ahead and check with their CPA, but instead of getting hit with capital gains, if this is a high value property or if this is something that is you know, a, a rental or whatever it is, then they're taking a hit on this over time. It's not all in a lump sum, okay? If you sell this property, your capital gains are about, I think they're about 15%. You know, if they're in a situation where they're gonna get charged for capital gains, then they're gonna lose a lot of money right up front, 
okay? Whereas in this scenario, it's a little bit over time, okay? So that's another advantage. The other advantage to this is it is the same, if you have somebody who's telling you they're gonna rent it out, okay? It's the same as renting, okay? But not having the management headaches. Okay, it's the same thing. You have a renter who's in the property who's actually paying you two months rent up front, the first and last month, maybe a pet deposit, maybe a half month, something like that, but they're not gonna pay more than really two, maybe two and a half, uh, two and a, two and a half months, something along those lines. That's their down payment. And there's absolutely zero preventing them from destroying the property just as much as they would on a regular seller carryback. I mean, think about it. If they've got $2,000 on a, say, a $1,000 payment involved in a property, they're, you know, pretty likely that they could cause over $2,000 worth of damage to this property just by changing the oil on the carpet, okay? Whereas if they've got $20,000 down in a $100,000 property, they're less likely to go ahead and do that because they've got a lot more skin in the game. And in fact, they're going to be a lot less likely to do it because they're going to lose the entire $20,000. If they're going to rent it out anyway, you could sell it for higher and get the interest, have a higher down payment. It's the same thing as renting it out, but you don't have to go over there and change the evaporative cooler pads every summer. That is a big benefit to them. The other benefit to them, okay, is they can do it over and over. If this is a property that they don't need, okay, then they're able to go ahead and do this over and over and over again. Pray to the real estate gods and, and, you know, let's hope that it doesn't happen. Let's hope that you don't have to foreclose on them, Mr. Seller. But if they do, okay, you've got their original money that they put into the whole project. You've got their interest. You've got, you know, your capital gains that you've been able to take care of. You've been able to keep your hands off this property, not deal with it. Keep all that money that they're giving you and then turn around, fix it up again, put maybe a couple thousand in it, sell it again. Do the whole thing over and over. So there are just some of the benefits that they can do with seller financing. So hopefully this is helpful to you. You can see how you can sell a home through terms by maybe a little bit more than you could get on an original loan. Okay. So hopefully this has been helpful to you. I hope you can go ahead and sell this property that you're trying to sell that maybe is a little bit overpriced. Talk to your seller this week. See if you can get them to consider, just consider the thought of maybe doing an all-inclusive tra uh, trust deed or maybe include, uh, maybe doing seller financing if they own the property outright. Million different ways to do this. That's just one. We'll go over some more next week when I'm back. So if you have any other questions, feel free to comment below and I'll be sure to go ahead and answer it the best way I can. If you like this progress, you'd like to see more about financing, then again, please like down at the bottom. Yeah, there we go. Like down at the bottom and then go ahead and rate, comment, and subscribe. That'll help us out a lot. We'll get the word out. Feel free to go ahead and send this to any of your friends if you think this will help. And happy selling. Take care.